Love them or hate them, it looks like LED bulbs are here to stay. But which one do you buy, given the huge range to choose from? Hi, I'm Chris and welcome back to the channel. Energy efficiency and running costs are, I think, two of the most useful metrics to use when comparing similar LED bulbs along with price of course. And with over 100 different offerings for GU10 type LED bulbs between Screwfix and Toolstation alone, it can be hard to know which one to choose. And that's even before you've looked on Amazon. In this video, I'll compare a selection of GU10s, some I already had and some I've bought specially, to see how they stack up. Using the info printed on the box or published on the website, I'll look at the manufacturer's claims and then by doing some simple tests here in the workshop, see how they work out in practice. And if that's not enough to keep you interested, at the end of the video I'll be giving you details of my end of year 2024 giveaway, so make sure you keep watching. Which to compare then? Well, I've chosen GU10 bulbs because they're the ones we use most of in the handyman home, but the two metrics I'll use apply equally well to other types. My aim was to get sets of two bulbs, each with similar specs, so that I could make reasonable comparisons between them. But as my budget wasn't infinite, I could only pick a few. So these are what I ended up with. Set 1, made up of bulbs numbers 3 and 4, are higher wattage, cool white. Set 2, with bulb numbers 5 and 6, are lower wattage, but again cool white. Set 3, with bulb numbers 7 and 8, are medium wattage and warm white. It's by no means a perfect sample set, but there's a range of wattages, lumens ratings, two colour temperatures and a spread in prices, so it'll have to do. A couple of 50 watt halogens have also sneaked in, but more of that later. I'm assuming you'll already have a good idea of the most appropriate colour temperature, beam angle and whether it needs to be dimmable or not, based on what the bulb is to be used for and its intended location. Starting with energy efficiency then, we can calculate this by dividing the amount of light a bulb emits in lumens by the power it consumes in watts, to give the efficiency in lumens per watt. The other metric, and this will come as no surprise to anyone, is running cost, which goes hand in hand with the energy efficiency. A lot of manufacturers publish this in terms of kilowatt hours per 1000 hours, but I prefer to convert it into good old fashioned pound, shilling and pence by multiplying it by the unit rate. I just think it makes it more real that way. And of course, we should add the purchase price back into the comparison because we may not want to pay the asking price no matter how energy efficient the bulb might be. Using the manufacturer's data and starting with bulbs three and four, it's clear that the integral looks a much better bet than the one from Bell. With a lower wattage and higher lumens, it trumps the Bell across the board in terms of absolute lumens, energy efficiency, running costs and purchase price. Moving on to bulbs 5 and 6, the Wessex again looks a reasonably clear winner compared to the Philips. Although it only has 89% of the lumens, it has moderately better energy efficiency and running costs and is significantly less than 50% of the price of the Philips. Finally, comparing bulbs 7 and 8, it looks like the Lampowis is a better option than the LAP with higher energy efficiency and lower running costs, although admittedly at a 12% higher price. However, don't rush out and buy any of these just yet until you've seen the results from my tests coming up next. One final point before we start with the test though is the difference between halogen and LED, with the running costs of halogens being almost a factor of 10 greater, which should come as no surprise to anyone. It is worth highlighting though that the light output from a 50 watt halogen can be over twice as much as some of the lower powered LEDs. So if you ever replace a halogen with a 3.6 watt LED, don't be surprised if you can't read your newspaper. Anyway, on to the tests. What I aimed to do then was measure the actual power consumption for each bulb, and if I could, the emitted lumens. Measuring power was straightforward once I'd bought myself this handy little device and rigged up this arrangement on the bench goes without saying that you should be extremely careful if you're ever tempted to do something similar, as messing with electricity can be fatal. By the way, 
If you want to get your hands on one of these, don't forget to watch the end of the video for details on the giveaway. I also used a DVM to measure the voltage across the bulb so I could compare it with the power meter. The DVM read a couple of volts lower than the power meter, but that's less than 1%, so I'm happy enough with that. I took a few measurements for each bulb, after 1 minute, 5 minutes and 10 minutes, and averaged them out with the results shown here. Reading along the columns, we have the voltage as measured by the DVM, the voltage, current, power factor and power as measured by the power meter, and the manufacturer's stated power figure, and finally a comparison of the two power values. The positive value in the last column indicates the percentage by which the power meter reading exceeds the manufacturer's stated value, and a negative value the percentage by which it's lower. Ignoring the halogens and starting with the bell and integral, that's bulbs 3 and 4, we see that the actual power consumption as measured by the meter is within 2% either way of the stated value. Given the power meter is not a calibrated device, so any readings are only going to be useful from a comparison point of view, I think that's pretty good, especially given that the mains voltage can vary as well. The one thing that does jump out is that the integral has a much higher power factor, probably indicative of much more efficient circuitry within the bulb. By the way, if you're not familiar with power factor, I've included a couple of links in the description below. I particularly like the one by Fluke with their beer analogy, for obvious reasons. Looking next at the Philips and Wessex, bulls 5 and 6, we see more of a divergence between the measured power and the stated power. Both seem to be consuming less power than the manufacturer's data would suggest, up to almost 11% lower in the Philips case. I'm not sure we can draw any conclusions just yet, unless it's just that Philips are very conservative in stating the power consumption. And then we come to the lamp hours and lap, bulbs 7 and 8. The lap measures exactly as per the stated value, but what's going on with the lamp hours? The meter only indicates 3.8 watts as compared to the stated value of 5. That's a whole 24% lower. But also look at the power factor. It's right down at 0.27 as compared to the average value of just under 0.6, which is typical for downlight style bulbs like the GU10. I think we need to shine some light on what's going on. Sorry, couldn't resist that. So how to test the light output from each bulb, given I've still only got an app on my phone, and it only gives readings in lux or foot candles. I got a fair amount of flack, to be fair, most of it justified, when I did this in my video on replacing fluorescent tubes with LED equivalents. I've since toyed with the idea of buying a Pucker light meter, but the consensus amongst the comments seemed to be that spending anything less than a couple of hundred quid was a waste of time. So as I'm not up for that, I'm sticking with the phone and the app, but this time I'll at least do all the testing in the dark. As Lux measures the amount of light that is projected onto a surface, while Lumens measures the total amount of light emitted by a source, such as a bulb, it's important then to know how large an area the light is dispersed over. So, in this example, a 1000 lumens light source will result in 1000 lux over 1 square meter, but only 100 lux over 10 square meters. So I can't just slap my phone down anywhere and expect an accurate measurement, irrespective of whether the sensor and the app are any good or not. So time for some algebra. And don't all stop watching now, it's pretty easy. If we consider the light being emitted by the bulb as a cone, which in the case of a GU10 bulb should be a reasonable assumption, then if the area of the dark green circle is set to one square meter, the lux level measured at any point on that surface will equal the lumens emitted by the bulb. Hence, a 600 lumens bulb should give 600 lux. All we need to do then is figure out the height h of the cone needed to give an illuminated area of one square meter and we can set up our measurement rig accordingly. First thing to do is calculate the radius r of the circle. Now this bit of algebra I can remember as the area of a circle equals pi r squared, which gives us a radius of 0.564 meters. So all I need to do now is use a bit more algebra. Knowing the angle alpha and the radius r, we can calculate the height h of the cone. But using the correct angle is key as otherwise we could end up with a squat cone or a lanky cone, which would have completely different heights. So, taking a punt, I assumed that the cone would be the same as the bull's beam angle, i.e. 36 degrees. 
set alpha to half of this, i.e. 18 degrees, and we end up with a value of 1.73581 meters for height h. Simples. Ah, but if only. Despite multiple attempts, having positioned my phone exactly 1.74 meters away from the bulb at the central axis of the cone, I couldn't obtain anything like the lux levels you should expect. They were all noticeably lower. Major disappointment. What was the reason? Well, I suspect that one possible cause could be the diffuser I was using over the phone sensor. Too thick, and surely it would block out some light. Too thin, and, well, you can figure it out. I also wondered whether the effect of spill light might have something to do with it, such that the angle of the cone would be greater than the beam angle. It's at this point that I recognised my limitations and gave up trying to figure this out, and instead resorted to a bit of experimentation. Using the 600 lumen integral bulb, I found that if I moved the phone towards the bulb, I could achieve a pretty reliable reading of 600 lux at a distance of 1.32 meters. Using this setup, I was then able to get pretty sensible readings for four out of the remaining five LED bulbs. If anyone still watching knows more about all of this, please do post a comment, as I'm just a tinkerer in my garage. Enough of cones, beam angles and algebra. Let's have a look at the results and see what, if any, conclusions we can come to. I've highlighted the column headings for the manufacturer provided data and associated metrics in yellow and the column headings for my measurements in pink. I haven't bothered listing the running costs based on my power measurements, but you can easily work those out if you really want to. Starting again with the bell and integral, that's bulbs three and four, my measured lumens for the bell came out about 8% lower, resulting in an energy efficiency about 7% lower. But given the limitations of my lux level measurements, I wouldn't see that as being particularly significant. As the lux level measurements were effectively calibrated against the integral bulb, the results are as you would expect. But I don't think this takes away from my view that the integral is the much better option of the two. Moving on to the Phillips and Wessex, bulbs 5 and 6, the Wessex comes out broadly in line with the stated values, albeit the energy efficiency based on my measurements was around 7% higher. But again, I don't class that as significant. The Philips, however, is a different story. A 10% higher lumens measurement in combination with the lower power measurement gives an almost 24% boost in calculated energy efficiency. It seems to me that Philips are significantly overstating the wattage and understating the lumens for their bulb. But who am I to say that a multinational has got it wrong? However, the Wessex still looks like it's got the advantage based on its lower purchase price. And finally, we come to the lamp hours and lap bulbs 7 and 8. My lumens measurement for the lap is within 4% of the stated value, with resulting similar energy efficiency. So nothing to worry about there. But oh dear, the lamp hours is all over the place. With a measured power of 3.8 watts, that's 24% lower than the stated value, and measured lumens of 72, yes 72, just 16% of the stated value, this doesn't seem to me in any way what you would expect from a 5 watt bulb at all. And it's not just a single bad example, I've tried quite a few of the other bulbs in the box. What conclusions can we draw then? Well, with one or two exceptions, and taking into account the obvious limitations of my test setup, the information that the manufacturers provide does seem a reasonable basis on which to calculate a couple of metrics to compare similar bulbs. And of course that's what you'd hope would be the case. However, based on the bulbs tested here, Philips do seem to be hiding their light under a bushel, if you can forgive me yet another terrible pun. And as for lamp hours, well, well indeed. I went back to the specs on the Amazon website and after a bit of digging around managed to find the beam angle helpfully stated as 1.2 e to the power of 2 degrees or in layman's terms 120 degrees which explains a lot about the lumens measurement but not so much about the power measurement. It does show that you need to read all the specs though. Now in practice once I've found a decent bulb I tend to stick with it if I can. And for me, the integral 5.7 watt 600 lumen is the de facto choice in our home. So which one would you buy?
Well, if you've watched it through this far, thanks. I hope you found at least some of it of interest. And if you've just jumped forward for details of the giveaway, then welcome. All you need to do to stand a chance of winning is post a comment below that includes the phrase, shine a light, Chris. And I'll pick one from those I think are the funniest. No insults though, please, because you won't win. You don't need to be a subscriber to enter, though it would be great if you consider subscribing as I've got a lot more content planned for 2025. And what do you win? Well, you get all these bulbs, that's 20 in total, including one of my favourite integral 5.7 waters, so you can judge for yourself. All are brand new or have less than one hour's use. And yes, I'm afraid that does include the lamp hours ones. Plus one of these excellent little plug-in power meters, ideal if you're looking to monitor electricity consumption. And that makes a total giveaway value of more than £40. Closing date for entries is Sunday 19th of January 2025 and I'll announce the winner before the end of that month. Usual rules apply, see the description for details. And so that's it. If you're a regular viewer, thanks for your support during the year. If you're new to the channel, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Ah, wait, what about Bulb Lifetimer here you say? You didn't mention that. Well, to be honest, it never really enters into my decision making at all. Even if the claimed lifetime is only 15,000 hours, never mind 20 or 25, that still equates to more than five years use at eight hours a day. All from a bulb that typically costs less than £1.50 to buy. I'll take that any day of the week. Whether you actually get that sort of performance is a different question. Well, that's for another day. Perhaps. Cheers.